I'm Stephen Priest with Class1ModelWorks.com, and today we've got a great and special presentation for you. We're going to talk about one of my all-time favorite cars, and that is 86-foot uh, auto parts cars. And when we talk about that, it's a general family of cars. There were many manufacturers, and uh, today we're going to push some of those aside and just talk about the Thrall built cars. Thrall was a major car company, uh, major producer of cars, produced all types of cars, and they had a very successful run from the mid-1960s until the late 70s, uh, where they produced 86-foot uh, cars. So here's a photograph of one of the cars. Um, and these cars were really big, but they weren't, oddly enough, uh, designed to carry a whole lot of weight. Uh, they were 70 or 100 ton cars, depending on what railroad ordered them and how they wanted the cars outfitted. And primarily their task was to haul auto parts. And auto parts uh, are very light. We're talking about stampings like fender stampings and things like that. So they needed a lot of square footage inside, but they didn't necessarily need a lot of capacity, in other words, uh, weight capacity. The Thrall cars were built over a period of years, like I mentioned, and there were a lot of changes that happened, and we're going to talk about some of those changes today. We're going to talk about changes to the underframes, although we're not going to go into depth with that. There were a lot of different types of, of Keystone and other uh, cushioning devices for cushion cars, like the Santa Fe Super Shot Control and the SP cars and things like that. So we're not going to get super in-depth in that. I do want to talk about easily identifiable uh, body changes, though. This is going to be important because as we, we look at this as a model and we think about producing models of that, we have to divide this up into basically categories or classes that we're going to produce model-wise. And in each one of these classes, of course, uh, were ordered at different periods of time, and there were different railroads that ordered cars from different classes. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, on the screen there, you'll see there's a list of cars, and we call them types. Uh, James Kincaid uh, did a, uh, a very thorough uh, look at uh, the body variations, and we'll talk about why these body variations exist as well, uh, and came up with basically uh, seven classes or types. And I'm not going to read through these right here because we're going to talk to you and actually show you graphically uh, those body types. So first of all, these cars primarily, although they, they have since and in the past were used to haul other things as well, primarily they were auto parts cars. And if you look at the image here, you'll see that the, uh, some of the railroads actually had auto parts even written on the side of the car, uh, in particular the Santa Fe did. Um, and then there's a couple images there, which you'll see little larger versions of here in a bit, of uh, auto parts inside the cars uh, being held in racks. Here's a Santa Fe car, um, and you can notice uh, one of the things that's, that's a keynote feature of, the, of these cars is the immense doors, the very large doors that allowed the automobile manufacturers, the stamping plants, and the assembly plants to move large quantities uh, through in and out of the car quickly by, by placing everything in racks or kind of palletized system. And the larger the door, obviously, the larger those pallets or racks can be, and you can get them in and out of the cars quicker, which was, of course, uh, one of the things they wanted to do. Um, the picture on the uh, here that you can see the auto body parts, and you can see a rack sitting in there. And then at the right hand side, which is a smaller image there, you can see the Equipco bulkheads, and those bulkheads would move uh, inside the car uh, back and forth and could be locked into the floor and into the ceiling and, and rails. And that's how the, uh, the racks were. Uh, were held in place in the cars. Again, here you can see there's some uh, some body hoods, basically car tops. I don't know exactly what your cabin tops, I guess, uh, to the uh, to automobiles in a, in a car. And then the lower picture, the the Pennsylvania Railroad car, you'll see that there's body stampings being loaded and unloaded at the Chrysler plant or a Chrysler plant. Not sure which one it is, uh, with some forklifts. But you'll notice in and out pretty quick with the forklifts in and out of the car. And then of course the upper image again is the Santa Fe car where you can see the auto parts actually shown on the car. And if you look really closely at that auto parts picture down in the lower right hand corner, if you can see that it actually says Ford, or Mo Ford Motor Company on it as well. Uh, these cars were pooled and sometimes, uh, I guess initially, when these were delivered they carried Ford on there. I'm sure that was painted out in later years as the cars were cycled. The roofs on these cars, on the Thrall cars, were, were all the Stanray roofs. And these are some drone uh, footage uh, shot by my son uh, when he was out doing research for us, and you can see the Stanray roofs on the car. They basically had that diagonal pattern on it. The roof is slightly peaked toward the center 
uh, for drainage, and then there's a bead that runs along the roof uh, for strength down the entire length of the car. Um, the blue car there, by the way, you can also see inside of that, the door was ajar when they went out to the Claycomo Ford plant here, and uh, you can see some of the racks inside of that car. Uh, that's how the lading was carried. So you'll notice there's a lot of air in the car, uh, which of course, if this was full of sand or grain, that would, the car would, would, would be, well, it would be broken in half, but it would, it, would be, <laughs> it would be way beyond its capacity. But since there's a lot of air in the car, um, these are just 70 or 100 ton cars. The next thing I want to talk about, just, just briefly, because it does matter when we look at making models of these cars or I identifying and understanding the cars, is the underframes. There's basically two types of underframes, not draft gear, but just underframes, and those are different things. Uh, there is the cushion underframe, and then there's the end of car cushioning. The cushion underframe, the entire center sill of the car slides from one end of the car to the other, and the cushioning mechanism is in the center of the car. So if you push on one end of the draft gear, it sticks out the other end. The end of car cushioning is, is, is not that way at all. All the cushioning is literally held separately on the A and B end of the car, and the, uh, the cushioning occurs only at that location. So if you push on one end of this car, the other end doesn't do anything. Here is a, uh, a view of the, uh, of the uh, underframe on the uh, uh, cushion underframe, and you'll notice what you have in this car is you kind of have two underframes. You have an outer set of frames, and then you have an inner set of frame, and that inner frame, you can see, will slide between the, the outer rails, and it actually will slide all the way down the center of the car from A end to B end or B end to A end. So it's a very active system with a lot of metal moving within the car. So uh, very interesting. Uh, this also manifests itself a little, a little bit when you look at the car from the outside because of the type of draft gear and the appearance of the draft gear, how the couplers stick out. And in particular, uh, you can look at, if you look at the down on shot, you'll notice that the, uh, the uh, draft gear is different. All right, so let's start talking about some of the, the types of cars. So the type one cars <clears throat> uh, differed from other classes because they were basically a body style that had a single weld bead vertically, and they had 10 panels, so you had an indent on the end of the car, you had 10 panels, and then you had the doors, and then you had 10 panels, and you had an indent again. And the reason that Thrall had different car sides, uh, me and, uh, in particular, James Kincaid, his, his theory is, and it's probably a very good theory, having talked with him quite a bit about that, and that is that Thrall had a relatively size, uh, small size plant where they were building these cars, and the, the sides of these cars are enormous, they're immense. And so, the, and they're built laying flat, so Thrall didn't have space to build these, so they contracted them out with other builders, and then they were delivered as assembled sides. And as they went through time, and they went through different contractors, basically the contractors had different methodologies for uh, uh, fastening the, the side panels together. Um, you'll have <clears throat> single welds, you'll have double welds, which we'll see, and then we'll have riveted versions as well, where you'll have all the bumps uh, for the, the double rows of rivets. And the early cars and the, that were delivered first were the Type 1 cars. These cars were the only ones of these, uh, the Thrall 86 foot cars that had roof walks or running boards, as some people will call them, and it, uh, that's an ongoing debate <coughs> uh, with people what to call them. But anyway, so long story short, um, these cars were delivered with roof walks, running boards, and high brake uh, rigging. In other words, the high, the, your handbrakes, if you look, are mounted way up toward the top of the car uh, so that somebody that was using, uh, walking down the tops of the cars could actually set the brakes. These, of course, in latter years would be removed from these cars, and uh, I believe most of the railroads eventually lowered the brake, uh, the handbrakes as well. Um, you'll see photographs <clears throat> of these cars that you can clearly tell they had roof walks on them. Uh, because there's some mounting hardware locations up in the center of the cars on the ends that held the end brackets. The other thing I want to talk about a little bit is the frame gussets. On the cushion under frames, since the center sill is sliding back and forth, in order to get continuity in the structural beam from the left to the right side of the car, you had a, a, a sliding sill which is sliding through there. They had a beam and then they put a beam underneath there so that the sliding sill went over that beam and between the two side beams. And that's basically what the frame gussets are. Um, you can clearly see the frame gussets hanging down on this car, and that's why I wanted to talk about it. 
uh, is because uh, you, can, you can see it. And basically it's kind of an I-beam that you're seeing it, uh, a section of uh, from the ends uh, hanging down underneath the car there. Here you can see the running boards as well. And then the last difference again was we had an indent in the end of the car where the, where the ladders are. And uh, eventually, uh, with subsequent orders of these cars, uh, Thrall went back and put the indents on either side of the doors as well. And this was probably a strengthening move, probably a rigidity move because of the large open space that when the car doors were opened or in transit, we, they needed a little more structural strength on either side of the doors uh, uh, to make the car uh, stable and structurally sound. Here's a roof view of the running board uh, walkway and you can clearly see it and you can also see at the bottom of the image there you can see the, uh, the handbrake uh, there as well. This date, uh, was, car image is dated in 1964. Uh, which was the beginning of the production itself. The Type 2 cars uh, were very similar to that, um, and they had, of course, the, uh, the uh, indent on the ends, but didn't have the indents on either side of the doors as of yet. That's why you see 10 panels, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and the indents on the edge. Uh, the primary difference in these cars really was the, uh, the removal of the roof walk um, at this point. Otherwise, the cars are very similar. Also, this car has double welds. In other words, when they built the sides for this, there's a pair of welds instead of just a single weld, and that's a, a difference in the car as well. Here are some photos of the Type 2 cars. You'll notice that if you look on either side of the doors, that the uh, door body just goes right up, or the car body goes right up to the door. There are no indents in subsequent classes of cars. Uh, if you look where the, uh, the end ladders are, there's an indent in the side of the car. You're going to see those same indents show up on either side of the doors uh, themselves. Again, if you look at the Burlington Northern car, if you look under the car, you can see the gussets running across underneath the, uh, the cushion underframe. Um, many of these cars, even in the same class like Type 2 or Type 3 or Type 4s, you could order them with cushion underframe or uh, end of car cushioning. So they may or may not have these gussets underneath depending on how the railroad ordered the car and what underframe type they ordered. So it's quite interesting uh, to look at the variations. Uh, through production. So type 3 car, um, double welds again, an indent, and we now have an indent on either end of the car, uh, or excuse me, on either side of the door, uh, so we now only really have uh, nine panels. So we have an indent on the end of the car, nine panels, an indent, and then the door, and then the same thing reflected again on the other end of the car. Of course, again, uh, frame gussets are there depending on what type of underframe you ordered. Uh, with the car. Here you can see, you can start seeing the indents on, on the sides of the, uh, the door. Uh, the Milwaukee car uh, door up there, the Milwaukee road door, excuse me, you can see on either side of that, you can clearly see the indents on that. <clears throat> Here again is another Type 3. Uh, I chose this image because you can very, very, very clearly see the uh, double welds on this car. And, you know, as a modeler and as a model producer, it's always interesting to look at the sides of the cars and look at all the ripples in the metal. And most cars, especially when they were new, you could see it better because they, the cars were shiny and it reflected, so the sheen actually makes that more visible. But most cars have this effect where you've got those ripples on the side of the car. And uh, you know, we look at producing that, but I'm not, uh, I'm not sure what the end user would think about a car that would come with the ripples on the sides of that, but I always thought it was interesting looking at that. This car also is interesting because a lot of these cars, since they had aluminum doors, the doors were immense. So the cars were made of aluminum to save on weight and, and to, to make them a little, uh, a little uh, easier to hinge and open and close because if you have steel there, you're gonna have a lot more weight than just aluminum. The doors on this car uh, in particular are painted blue, which is, I'm not gonna say a rarity, but most railroads left these doors in their raw aluminum form. Uh, of aluminum color, in, and it was interesting in latter years when they would repaint these cars, uh, a lot of roads would leave those doors in raw aluminum, so you'd have a brand new looking car with horrible looking doors, uh, aluminum doors, so that's something to, to think about and stare at when you're looking at cars as well. So type 4 cars. Type 4 cars again, uh, we've now got double walls on the cars, on the sides of the cars, uh, and you've got the indents on either side, and we're back to 10 panels on the doors. We, uh, if you remember, the last car had nine panels. 
We're back to 10 on this, so we've got an indent, 10 panels, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and then an indent. Uh, so, and then that repeats on the other side of the door. So again, we've now changed the car sides again. Uh, we have the indents on either side of the door, we have the indents on the ends, but we now have 10 panels with double welds. So again, if you're out in the field and you're looking to, uh, to spot that, uh, it's an easy spot. You just count up to 10 and bingo, you got a Type 4 car. The Western Pacific car in particular there, you can very clearly see the, the indents on either sides of the door and of course the two end indents. The Western Pacific car also has the gussets underneath, running underneath the car. You can quite clearly see them. And of course, those are the structural members that, that run around the sliding sill of the, uh, the underframe, the cushioning devices. Um, the Western Pacific car there also has painted doors, if you'll notice. The Rio Grande and the CNNW down below there uh, do not. Here's a picture of a Type 4 car, one of the Rio Grandes with the doors open. Again, you have a new shiny car and look at the ripples uh, on the sides and in the, in the sheet metal work on the sides of the car, which is quite interesting uh, to say the least. <laughs> um, this car has its doors open. You can see how wide the opening is and kind of on the left side, which is kind of to the reporting mark side of the GNR, uh, DNR GW, you'll notice one of the, uh, the large sliding movable bulkheads, which are pushed up against the load and then locked in place so the load doesn't shift uh, during the movement of the car. Here's the Santa Fe car. Uh, obviously, it's got the lumen doors, and down on the right is a Milwaukee car that, uh, that uh, does not. And actually, that Milwaukee car uh, shouldn't be in there. It's actually a riveted side car. It's a different class. So ignore that Milwaukee car at this point because it's actually in the wrong spot. So we'll probably look at it again here in a minute. So here's our Type 5 cars. The Type 5 cars uh, interjected another interesting uh, body design. Uh, and that is uh, a notch over the truck centers. And this was probably to aid with the jacking of the car uh, to create a spot that was a little higher up. These have pretty low side sills, these cars do. And I imagine there were some car jacks uh, in some shops that would, not, that would not crank down that low. And so probably what happened is they got some complaints from uh, some of the railroads and they put that notch above the truck so the car jacks could fit into there for jacking or lifting point on the car. And uh, then again, this car is, uh, it's got the indent, 10 panels indent again. And this car uh, has got the double rivets. So again, uh, Thrall went back, uh, went out to a, a different outside contractor, and this contractor delivered the cars uh, with rivets, double rows of rivets uh, and 10 panels. So you can uh, very clearly see that uh, you can see in the black and white image area, you can see the, uh, the rivets, the double rows. And it's interesting because the rivet pattern is not the same either. You've got a, a very narrowly spaced set of rivets and you have a wide spaced set of rivets on each row. And I imagine, and this is just theoretical, uh, I imagine that the tight set of rivets was what was used to hold the panels together. Uh, and then probably the wide set of rivets are the ones that are spaced for their part is what they were affixing the panels, the side panels to the inside frame members of the car is probably what that was. Um, you'll notice uh, another interesting thing in this is when they made the, uh, the notch for lifting or jacking the cars, they had to move the car uh, tow lug, which is the, the point where you can hook a chain or whatever onto the car, they had to move it off center. So if you look at the black and white image in particular, you'll see the notch there and then off to the side, you'll see the little kind of U-shaped ring hanging down. Uh, the tow jacking uh, location on the car, and that was moved off the center of the truck uh, to allow that to have the uh, new location and allow the jack pad area. These cars both have uh, painted doors, if you'll notice, uh, which is interesting. Uh, the DNR GW car down below there, that's an ex Rock Island car. If you look closely at the right hand panel of that car, <coughs> which is the A end on this particular view, you'll notice the uh, <coughs> lighter paint swatch there which is where Rock Island, where the Rock Island lettering resided on the car prior to the uh, DNR GW picking these cars up. Uh, I'm sure this uh, after the uh, Rock Island bankruptcy in 1980. The, the date is uh, 1984 on the car, so this would have been four years after the Rock Island bankruptcy. I don't know exactly when the Denver and Rio Grande uh, picked those cars up. If anybody knows that information, I'd really be interested in uh, knowing when the uh, DNRGW actually did purchase the cars. 
Um, but uh, obviously we know that they came from the Rock Island because of the... Uh... So the Type 6 car is one of the most unique cars um, in this whole set or whole this study of the Thrall 86 foot cars. And not because it's a has a twin set of uh, door openings on each side, but because the Type 6 cars were only purchased by one railroad, and that was the Illinois Central uh, purchased these cars. And the, the thing that sets these cars off from the Type 7 cars, which also have two sets of two doors, or a set of eight doors, or two per car side, uh, is the fact that these cars have a single weld on each side instead of a twin weld, which the Type 7 cars have, which we'll look at here in a minute. So this was an earlier car, a little earlier car. These were actually delivered to the IC in brown paint, which you'll see here in a minute. And then, of course, they were painted orange later and probably went into the gray as well, into the, uh, the AT&T Death Star uh, IC gray scheme as well. So anyway, again, frame gussets on this car, uh, indents as well. Uh, the panels stayed the same on these cars, so we're not counting panels, but there are indents on either side of the doors. Stan Ray roof like we had earlier and no roof walk or running board. Here is the uh, uh, Type 6 car. This was how they were delivered with the uh, main, line of Mid main line of Mid America, uh, Tuscan, uh, dark uh, boxcar brown uh, kind of car color. And uh, you'll notice the two sets of doors. You'll notice the guts gussets underneath the car. They're clearly visible hanging down. And you'll also notice the silver door, which is uh, interesting as well. Uh, the Maxi Cube down there, I guess these cars were eventually sold and then sold again and sold again. Wisconsin Central ended up with some of them. And uh, it's just interesting, the, the lineage of these, how they passed, uh, passed through time. There's a little bit of theory on my part, and, and I haven't been able to prove this yet. Maybe some of you out there can, can prove this. But I think these cars, these Type 6, might have been delivered with roof walks. And the reason I... I say that as there's a couple indicators that, to me, that they were delivered with uh, high brake uh, or, or maybe low brake, uh, but, but roof walks. And the, the first thing is, if you look above the ladder notch on the Maxi Cube, there are some uh, bolt patterns that look like the ladder at one time went all the way up. And then if you look at the end of the car, uh, there are, there's a pair of bolt openings or, or, or uh, fastener openings up in the center of the car toward the top near where the, where the white is. So, these cars might have had roof walks at one time. I haven't found any uh, images yet that, that I can prove that with, but uh, that is a possibility. So I'll be looking for those, and if any of you that know that information and have images, we'd love to see them. Then the last uh, uh, car we're going to talk about, which is the last class of cars, or unofficial class, is the Type 7 cars. And again, uh, the main difference between the Type 7s and the Type 6 is, uh, because they're nearly identical cars, is the... Uh, the double sets of welds on the seams on the side of the car instead of the single set. And so uh, that's basically the, the change uh, there between cars. And both have the underframe gussets, so they look the same uh, that way. And uh, then, of course, uh, obviously the door locations and things. Now, the door locations on the car, some of the cars did move <clears throat> an inch or so from side to side. But that is a very minor difference in cars, uh, but it did exist. And I wanted to point that out so that uh, the, those of you out there that are really, really, really into that super detail stuff and are going to worry about an inch in a car are aware that uh, some of these car dimensions or openings did move a little bit. Here's uh, some Type 7 cars. You'll notice uh, uh, one of my favorite paint schemes is the Detroit, Toledo, and Shoreline. That, that turquoise blue is just uh, stunning with that red logo on it. <clears throat> You'll notice uh, the double welds. You'll also notice down below the IC also had these cars. Uh, so they had both types of auto cars. <coughs> Excuse me, the, the Type 6 and then the, uh, the Type 7 double door versions, which is kind of interesting. The IC car in this image also has had one of its doors replaced. You'll notice it's a brighter color. Uh, these doors, because of their size, were a little subject to, little subject to damage. Uh, a lot of these cars later had an additional hinge point added to the top center of the car because there were a couple cases, uh, a couple letters I have in the files uh, that came with these cars where they have had those doors fall off the sides of the cars and the auto manufacturers had written Thrall and of course the Perspective Railroad saying, hey man, we're worried about people getting hurt and, uh, and or killed by these doors. We need to find some way to better secure them. So some of these cars, all the classes in later years, would have a third hinge added to the center of the car door uh, between the two rods, the two opening rods on the side of the car door. So uh, that's another thing to think about as well. 
Here's uh, some uh, relatively current pictures of these cars. Uh, they're still out running around, a lot of them. This car here, you can see the, th the CN car, which is the top, the blue car. You can see the additional hinge point added to the center of the door uh, between the other hinge points. So now you've got three support slash hinge points at the top of the door uh, to, to better secure that car door. Uh, that CN car also shows the indentions on either side of the uh, car doors very well. So you've got on these cars, you literally have six indentions, two on the ends where the ladders are, and then one on either sets of the on either set of the doors. And this is a spotting feature of these cars. So if, as opposed to the Greenville or Pullman Standard, <clears throat> you know, or our, uh, Pacific Car, of course, a pack car, you know, they've got the vertical ribs on them, but so they're an easy spot. But but uh, one of the spotting features that really sets these cars off is those indents on either sides of the door. Here's another picture of one of the cars, and you'll notice that uh, this has got the doors open. You'll notice how open those cars get with the doors open on them. And so it's really, really, uh, I imagine they can unload these relatively quickly with a couple good forklift operators, which of course is what they were going for. They were going for uh, efficiency in operations. And uh, they definitely got it with these cars because you could get in and out of them pretty quick with a forklift. And with that, uh, we're going we're gonna to end the little show and talk a little bit about Class1ModelWorks.com. We are bringing uh, variations of these and different versions of these cars out. Uh, these are cars, the uh, Thrall uh, Type 4 and Type 7s are actually for sale right now on our website at Class1ModelWorks.com. And uh, go there, visit. You can pick them up. They're due uh, in uh, the first quarter of next year. Uh, we hope uh, the, the, uh, uh, in January at some time, um, but uh, we'll uh, hold off and wait for that. So, hey, thanks for tuning in today, and uh, we'll be bringing more information. Again, you can go on the website, class1modelworks.com, and uh, pre-order these cars today.